with uh, the virtual background of Holy Cross Anglican and St Margaret's uniting in Hackett near the Holy Roundabout in the inner north of Canberra. Um, I want to welcome you all as your MC. My name is Tony Hassan. And before we get started, here in our community, we do have a tradition as is quickly picked up around Australia in acknowledging that we're on Indigenous country here on Ngunnawal country. And at Holy Cross Hackett, we also acknowledge a triune creator, the great steward uh, behind all things in the context of thanking the stewards that are the First Nations peoples of this country. We acknowledge today the cultures of our First Nations peoples thankful for their care of our common home. And we pay our respects to custodians of this land and their elders, both past, present, and also emerging. Well, welcome everyone to this special online event, part of this Sustaining Our Future Festival 2021, hosted by the Social Justice and Environment Group of Holy Cross Anglican and Uniting St Margaret's in Canberra. I'm a member of that group and a, a long-standing pilgrim in the Christian story, having moved from Sydney to Canberra some years ago. What inspires me and many of our faith uh, community, people of faith and no faith, is hope for a better world. Seeking wisdom to live well and with insights and models that support and sustain life in all its forms. So we don't take for granted human relationships and we don't take for granted the natural world on which we depend. Now, there's no doubt successive ACT governments have understood the case for sustainability, especially in the face of an undisputed warming planet. But implementing policy and actions across households and public infrastructure with the evidence in mind is another matter altogether. You'll also know that integrity and trust has been in the news. That's a context here today, an important one, holding elected officials to account for what they've said and how they're tracking. And rather than the adults asking the questions, today we have two Canberra young people, representing Canberra's young people, who will be putting the questions to Minister Rattenbury. They are in his electorate of Currajong, as is Holy Cross and St Margaret's, uh, the electorate of Currajong that Rattenbury uh, represents. Shane Rattenbury is, of course, the leader of the ACT Greens. He's been a member of the ACT Legislative Assembly since 2008. This, his fourth term, he's become the Attorney General, holding other portfolios as well, important roles in a power-sharing arrangement with Labor. Before politics, Minister Rattenbury practised as a solicitor and barrister and worked for Greenpeace International, and I say all of this because to say that he understands the logic of social and environmental change and how to bring about change. This afternoon, Shane Rattenbury is here as the Water, Energy and Emissions Reductions Minister to discuss the ACT's progress on things like 100% renewable electricity and many other issues around sustainability a year on from last year's 2020 election. Asking the questions are students in Year 12 at Dixon College, Kate Dyson and Matt Begby. Parishioner Rachel Morgan will also offer a summary at the end of a short time of questions through the chat. And so it's a delight to welcome you, especially Shane, Kate and Matt. And the first question this afternoon to the Minister is from Kate Dyson. Hey everyone, my name's Kate. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, before we begin, um, we are a little pressed for time. We only have an hour. I know Matt and I have quite a few questions and our audience will as well at the end. Um, so Shane, we just sort of ask that you try to keep responses decently brief. Um, last time we had this forum was a year ago, which was just before the ACT election. Uh, so congratulations on your re-election. Um, could you briefly tell us something that you are proud of having achieved in the last year as Minister for Climate Change and Sustainability? Sure, thanks Kate and um, Matt, good afternoon. Thanks Tony for the welcome and it's great to join you all again. I can't believe it's a year since the election. It's really nice to have this opportunity to come together 
and Kate, I will keep them quick today. Look, there's a lot going on. I think one of the things that I was really pleased about coming out of the election was obviously with having more Greens in the Assembly, there's, there's more things we can focus on. We wrote a parliamentary agreement with the Labor Party to form the government for the next four years and climate change in particular features very strongly in that agreement. There's also some biodiversity issues, but I guess climate change is one of the central ones. That's been really important for me and we've been able to make some progress on some of those things already, uh, including getting more incentives in place for electric vehicles in Canberra and also focusing on uh, particularly, I'm really got a strong emphasis on the just transition, that idea that we have to make a whole lot of change to tackle climate change, but we need to make sure we do it in a socially fair way. And so we put in place some good strategies like that. I'm happy to talk more about them, but that's big picture wise. I think the main thing for me is there's still a really strong focus on these issues and it's a big part of this government's agenda for the next four years. Wonderful. I think we've got our next question moving on to Matt. Um, hi. Uh, so obviously it's been a tough year in terms of COVID and the pandemic and lockdowns. And we just wanted to, to ask and talk a bit about how these things have delayed or negatively impacted climate action in the ACT? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think inevitably some things have been delayed, but the good news is that plenty of things have kept going on in the background as well, whilst a lot of the government and a lot of the public service has been very focused on COVID, those that aren't are still doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality is, is that, as we've seen from the IPCC report this year, we can't wait. Climate change is already with us. We, this is the critical decade as we've been so clearly told. And so we can't stop doing things for a year. And I've been really pleased that both last year's budget and the budget we're about to release this week have seen quite a bit of investment in climate change issues, uh, money to both on resilience and cutting emissions. And so the government hasn't been standing still in that regard. Uh, we've seen a commitment in this past week to plant 54,000 more trees over the next four years. Uh, which is an enormous contribution to making Canberra more resilient and cooler in the future in the, in the face of a heating climate. So uh, probably, I, I think a few projects have slowed down, but certainly the work has not stopped. Could you uh, quickly talk about some of those projects which have, which have slowed down a bit? Oh, I'm trying to think of a few off the top of my head. Um, Probably some of the areas in terms of plan, uh, planning work on buildings. Um, you know, buildings are a big source of energy use in Canberra, and we need to have buildings that are both more energy efficient, but also better built to cope with the extremes of temperature. Some of that work is probably not progressed as quickly as I'd like to see. Yeah, it's one good example that I can think of here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we had our next question was about information around climate legislation and uh, mm -hmm. being available to MLAs as well as to the public. Uh, it mentions in the parliamentary agreement that a commitment or administrative reform that is detailed there is to ensure that MLAs have access to all the climate impacts and analyses of new legislation. Is this something which could be or should be made available to also to the public? Yes, I think it should be. And in making it available to MLAs, it becomes a public document. Uh, so it is available to the public in that sense. Um, one of the things we have worked on in the last couple of years is moving from a triple bottom line analysis to what's called a wellbeing assessment. And so now both legislation and a whole lot of budget decisions go through what's called the wellbeing analysis. And there's a whole lot of areas in that that are measured and certainly climate change and environment is one of those key areas. And there's other ones like um, social connectedness and economic advancement. So it's a sort of, a, it's, a, you know, it's all the spectrums of our, all the, the parameters of our life that are really important. Uh, but those are also publicly available as part of of that assessment process and, and so that people can read those documents. Thank you, yeah. Um, there was one quick question just in relation to making information public. Yep. Uh, we've done some, just in our, in our research for this, we came across uh, a report which is being compiled now 
on the a, a risk assessment of the impacts of climate change on government services in the ACT, but this won't be made available to the public. I was wondering if you had any any thoughts on that about why it isn't or yes that report is actually being commissioned by another part of government so i don't have all the details on it it's being commissioned out of the chief minister's area but look it's uh, it's designed to inform government thinking over the next few years my instinct is it should be available i think it'll be a really interesting document uh, i haven't seen it yet it's a, you know still being prepared by the the consultants that are doing it but yes my view would be it probably should be released publicly because i think a lot of people would find it really interesting i mean there's a lot of information out there and yeah. what i find really interesting is how we make sure more people access some of that information you know a lot of these reports get read by well you know maybe a hundred keen people in canberra who sort of bother to go and search for the information and probably a lot of them are on this call today yeah. uh, but you know and i do an annual minister's report on the state of the environment, but I'm not sure many people read them. They get tabled in the assembly, they are available online. So I think the interesting job for government to think about is how do we present the information in a way that more people will take the time to look at? Yeah. You know, so it's, and not to dumb it down, but to present it in a way where people who are a bit interested can actually see things and make sense of it. And those who are more interested can get even more detail if they want to. Mm, thank you, yeah. Not to keep going on this question for too long, but is that something which you think is being worked on or will be worked on, trying to make the information not only available to the public, but actually distributed and uh, and like given to the public in a way which they actually take note of and are conscious of? Yeah, look, it's a good question. I think that is a constant project. We have just revamped and launched in the last few days our environment groups website uh, so that for people who want to who sort of think oh well climate change is serious i should do something there's a whole new website which we think will be a lot more accessible and a lot easier for people uh, one of my teams at the moment is working on how to produce information on electric vehicles in a way that is more easy to understand because mm. lots of people are going oh maybe this is the way of the future but i don't know much about it i'm nervous and they want to know so we're producing um, and different versions of that brochure with different levels of information. So we are constantly thinking about it, but I think it is, uh, you know, the great story of climate change over the last probably 30 years is that it hasn't necessarily been communicated to all of the community in the right way. You know, there's lots of people who still don't believe it or don't think it's going to impact on them. And so all over the world, there's a discussion of how do we do this job better? Thank you. Yeah, obviously, sort of with COVID, we've especially seen that it's the age of misinformation and we've known that that's true for climate change and sustainability as well. Um, so it's good to hear that the government is looking at how to sort of push forward um, that and look, push forward the accessibility of the information. Um, now, two weeks ago, we had a sort of similar forum with Ambassador Ispista. Um, and he said that it was difficult to eliminate fossil fuels because many communities are dependent on them, particularly in Queensland and New South Wales. But the ACT, we don't have any coal or gas mines. Does this make us detached from the issue and has sort of made us more able to go to the 100% renewable? It's a really interesting question. I think the ACT doesn't have those. And so, yes, it's not saying we have to think about We have a different set of problems to think about. You know, we are a city very reliant on gas in the way we operate our city. And so, uh, whereas parts of Queensland probably don't use nearly as much gas as we do. They just produce it and pipe it down. So I think there's different transition issues for different communities. As the ACT, we have a job to cut our emissions as good global citizens. And we've got to deal with the types of emissions we have. Those big issues around coal mines in particular, but also gas fields, that there is no question we need to eliminate those, the extraction and use of those fossil fuels. The science is extremely clear. And again, the IPCC report is reminded of this year how urgent that situation is. But we can't just say bad luck to the people in Queensland. I talked earlier about that idea of a just transition. And that just transition is the notion that we have to take people with us. And so in Canberra, that will look like making sure that as we eliminate our use of gas, we help households easily get rid of their old gas appliances, 
and replace them with all electric appliances. Or as we make our bus fleet electric, the diesel mechanics who used to work on the buses get retrained to work on electric buses or to work on something else. In Queensland, that means as we stop doing coal mines, we need to think about well, what are the opportunities for those workers? And is that having a solar panel factory in Gladstone, which at the moment is a heavy fossil fuel town, or is it something else? There's lots of ideas. I think the real injustice is to not help those communities make the transition. Yeah, absolutely. So sort of on the topic of going 100% renewable in the ACT, the government in the agreement with the Greens Labor Agreement um, for the parliament, it has a commitment to phase out gas by 2045 while mm -hmm. still keeping grid stability. Um, now, I know I personally was affected by the Western Inner North uh, power outage on AFL Grand Final Night. Um, oh, really? But we've also found that it's quite expensive to disconnect gas from a property. So it costs $800 to disconnect. Um, and that's not including new electric systems, which where like a hot water, electric hot water system can cost over $4,000, which honestly seems like a disincentive to disconnect. So are we on track to meet this 2045 goal? And what is the government making, doing to make it easier for residents with gas pipes already to disconnect? There's a whole lot of questions in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's a, it's a really good set of questions. I think a lot of campgrounds, you know, we, for a long time in this city, long before, Kate, you were born, you know, we've been told that gas is a fantastic way to heat out in our city. And gas was cheap. And compared to the old coal-fired power stations, it was relatively clean. You know, and for a long time, we were told that story. But now gas is just another fossil fuel, and it's quite an impactful fossil fuel in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So we do need to transition away. We've got, you know, I think what the ACT government, in saying we want to transition away from it, we're the only jurisdiction in Australia who has said that. And we've given ourselves 25 years to do it. And so that means we can do it most cost-effectively because we're not doing it suddenly in the last five years, we're going to do it over time. And so if I go to your example about the cost of a hot water system, they are expensive, but all hot water systems are expensive. And what we want to do is say to people, when your hot water system reaches the end of its natural life, then replace it with an all electric one. So don't rip your, if you've got a gas one at the moment that's working quite well, let it run out, give it the five years, but start planning to get an electric one to replace it. That's, I think, the way we can do this transition reasonably quickly, but still in a way that's cost effective. Your point around disconnecting the gas is true. It does cost nearly, it only costs about $200 to get it connected, but it costs about $800 to disconnect it. So clearly the gas company is trying to discourage people from disconnecting the gas. We've been researching this quite a lot because I've had a few people contact my office about it. Um, I've checked with the national regulator because it's a regulated cost and they have said that is the fair cost to disconnect the gas. So it's legitimate in that sense. What we've learned, and this is the sneaky tip, is that best trick is to just close your account but not ask to have the gas dis disconnected because it costs you nothing to close your account and they just turn it off and it's still quite safe. Right, and Okay. And what we've also learned is that if you do that after about two years, they actually come and remove it for free because it becomes a maintenance cost for them and they, it's cheaper for them to come and remove it. But this is sort of the sneaky trick that I just know because people who I know are really passionate about these issues and they've been experimenting with the system. It's not a great answer for everybody yet and we've got some work to do, but it's kind of fascinating as we're at the front edge of this working out how it works. Yeah, absolutely. I think, that was, I think that was all the questions. No, that was it. That was it. Yeah, no, that's good. So it was kind of a big dump of information. Um, but yeah, so you sort of saying that don't pay to disconnect and sort of don't replace things straight away, but sort of think about it as a process. Yeah. Does like does, actually, and one uh, other thing I should yeah. sorry, the one other thing I should add is that we're also providing economic support, financial support to help people make the transition. So, for example, um, there's the new sustainable household scheme where you can get an interest-free loan to go to an all-electric appliance, if you're going from gas to an all-electric. Uh, and we also have some dedicated programs for low-income households where we actually subsidise 
the cost to transition over, which again is that idea of the just transition. Some people can just afford to pay their new system and we'll give them interest-free loan to help. Other people, there's actually direct financial support to assist as well. So I think that's the other leg of those questions that you asked. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on the sort of the topic of, well, we've got this sort of sneaky trip, sneaky trick why isn't the government sort of doing anything to sort of make that a prominent idea or sort of telling the energy companies because um they're sort of decently misleading about how you have to disconnect or you don't have to disconnect so is the government planning to regulate the energy companies and say well actually people don't need to disconnect yeah look that is something i'm working on that sneaky trick i just told you we've only learned that in the last week or 10 days so it's hot off the press uh, you're the first person, you're the first group of people I've told that to. Um, and that's just been because it's actually been quite hard to work our way through. And there's no question that the gas company is trying to keep itself relevant. It wants to keep selling gas because that's what they do. And so, you know, there's an interesting question there, of course, that the ACT government owns part of Actu AGL. And so what I, part of what I'm working on is over time transitioning that and getting the company to also take a greater leadership role. And that's something we're working on with them at the moment. I'm one of the two shareholders, myself and the chief minister, are the government owners of that company. And so I'm using that opportunity. But, uh, you know, our gas infrastructure is worth three to $400 million, like all the pipes and all the networks in that. And so there's also a cost for the community there in thinking about how do we gradually ease our way out of, of that asset that we currently own. So it's a complex story. But... I think the good news is we've actually made the decision we're going to start that journey. And so therefore we're having to answer the sort of questions you're thinking about. They're all the right questions, but we're right at the front of working out how to do it. And we're the first ones doing it. So there's not necessarily an easy book on how to do it. Yeah. I think oh, to Matt now. I just had a thought during that, during that response about the just transition. I was wondering if you could talk about the difficulties that come with balancing transitioning away from these things which we know are harmful to our environment and which we need to get off balancing that with not doing it in a way which negatively impacts people or institutions or systems i was wondering if you could talk about how that's being done and how the problems which come with that yeah matt that really is the center of that idea of the just transition is that we we, we have to make the transition and we have to make it as quickly as we can, but at the same time, you know, really conscious of not everybody can afford to go out and just buy an electric car today, for example. Um, or back to Kate's example, you know, it is it does cost several thousand dollars to put in a new heating system or a new hot water system. So it's about trying to uh, make sure that we do it as we do it. We help people, whether that's with information, whether it's with financial support whether it's government putting in place the right rules so that the companies help people do it. There's all those facets to it we need to work on. And the other part of it, I think, is also what's referred to as the social licence, the idea that we have to convince the community to go with us as well. You know, not everybody uh, believes in some of these, that some of these transitions are even necessary. You know, uh, and you, all you have to do is read the comments section of, of any climate change announcement I make on Facebook or on the camera times, anything like that. And you'll see people saying, this is outrageous. Why should we give up gas? Gas is a great fuel. And so there's a, another part of that just transition is actually, you know, help make sure the community can all go with us as much as possible. It's not unlike the conversation about the COVID vaccine. You know, not everybody is convinced and we need to think carefully, how do we tell that story and, and take everyone along the journey with us. Thank you, yeah. Um, one of our, our next question was around engaging people in the community. It's sort of linked, engaging people in the community with these issues. So the, the Greens party have strong beliefs in participatory democracies and yep. things such as that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how that's being implemented or done since this last election. Uh, there's been talk of lowering the voting age in the ACT. Yeah. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on all of these things? 
Yeah, look, it does flow on nicely from that last conversation we're having because I think the more we involve the community and they're part of the decision-making, the more they feel empowered and they feel a sense of ownership of some of the decisions and a sense that they've been able to contribute ideas. Uh, one of my favourite examples is we actually did a new climate change strategy for the ACT from 2019 to 2025. So this was actually before the election, but we did it where we had a whole series of just community discussions. And I know a few of the people on this call in some of those discussions, but we asked the community to tell us what some of the policies were that we should put in place. And we got over a thousand ideas, like a thousand specific policy ideas that we had to sift our way through. And many of those are now in our climate change strategy. And so I hope that people who are involved in that process look at the strategy and go, well, actually, I see my idea in there. Or I see, you know, some of them were quite similar, so they came out in a slightly different form. That's one example. Um, at a more practical level, you've touched on lowering the voting age. We think that is really important. We want to lower the voting age to 16 because we think that both young people, frankly, are pretty smart. They, a lot of them think about the issues really carefully. Uh, I find when I talk to all sorts of young people, they're very engaged in the issues. Some people say, yeah, but not everyone who's 16 is mature enough to vote. Well, frankly, I've met plenty of 28-year-olds who are probably not mature enough to vote. You know, so I think I don't, I don't buy that argument. Um, and I think that young people should have an opportunity, particularly on these long-term issues like climate change, uh, to be involved. One of the other areas we've done some work is we have one, one of my favourite programs is the Zero Emission Grants Program. And it's a little program I created about three years ago now where we give out grants of up to $25,000 to individuals and community organisations who've got a great idea on how to tackle climate change and they're doing it from a really grassroots level. Because I think having those community ideas bubble up and there's lots of them out there, um, but sometimes people have got a great idea and they're like, geez, I only need 5,000 bucks or 10,000 bucks to get this going. And they're able to sort of bring that idea to the table, launch it, and often bring a lot of volunteers and a lot of community involvement. And I really like that program because it also is about empowering the community. It's not all about the government saying you have to do this or the government will do it for you. It's about allowing the community to be involved as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, just going back to the lowering the voting age, can you, I, I definitely agree with, with that argument. I think, especially considering the issue of climate change, how young people will be the ones affected the most mm -hmm. in years to come and have also been uh, close to the most involved, I think, like at, at rallies, there's the school strike for climate and everything like that. Can can you give us some insight into the arguments against lowering the voting age? Look, I touched on a little bit before. Some people just think that young people are not mature enough to vote. Uh, but certainly my view is that there's plenty of things you can do from 16. There's all sorts of things around making decisions about your own medical treatment. Um, you can, well, you can get your driver's L plates at, I think, 15 and nine months, isn't it? Yeah, yes. yeah. Someone who's younger than me, remind me, it's been a while for me. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things at 16 you're allowed to do. And I think voting sits equally as a responsibility alongside many of those other things. And so that's one key argument. There's also been a bit of a debate around whether it should be voluntary or compulsory voting mm -hmm. from the age of 16. Uh, and that's a slightly different issue. But, um, you know, we've thought about that recently and um, we think mandatory voting should apply to 16 year olds as well. If, you, if we're gonna give people a vote, we should have the same system for everybody. But that's been one of the other disputes as well. That's, that's interesting. Cause I was reading on that, the ACT liberals, that was one of their arguments, I think, about not subjecting people under 18 to like the possible repercussions for not voting with mandatory voting. Yeah, that is one issue. Is they're worried about people getting a fine or getting a, you know, cause you can't be, fined in Australia for not voting, of course. Mm. And they don't want to see young people getting caught up with the penalty system and those kind of things. And I think we can work a way around that. You know, potentially we could write the legislation so that if you're under 18, you don't vote, you get a warning as opposed to a fine. You know, mm. as a way of sort of saying, well, look, you're a bit younger, you're getting used to this. I think we could um, think our way through that problem. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know personally as sort of someone who's sort of decently young for my year, I know that lots of my friends are sort of ready to vote and able to vote. 
um, and sort of looking at especially the next federal election, they're all going to be able to vote by then. I mean, for the looks of it, I'll miss the margin by about a month or two. So the whole lowering the voting age seems to be sort of a pretty common topic. Um, but young people who sort of can't vote yet, like we're doing a lot to involve ourselves in climate action. We have forums like this, we have protests, like we even have federal court cases. Mm. But we're doing these things because we're feeling like our voice isn't heard. So what is sort of, what is the ACT government doing to make sure that you are hearing young voices, you're talking to young people, um, and you're really sort of involving us and empowering us? Um, it's not something that we're doing, but something that you're doing. Sure, that is a fair question. Uh, I guess for me personally, I try and make sure I just take the time to listen to people. You know, I go out a lot and just stand at shopping centres and stuff now. I don't find a lot of young people come and talk to me. It tends to be older people, but I think that's a way of trying to be in some of the spaces. Um, I've gone to a lot of the students' strikes for climate because I think it's important to go along both in solidarity, but it's often a place where you have a lot of conversations. Uh, so just at a personal level, there's sort of some of the things I try and do. Um, at a more formal level, you know, I think there's a role for government to improve how we do consultation. Because consultation traditionally is, hey, here's this process, write a submission. And not too many young people tend to write, sit down and write a submission. And so there's a challenge for us to think about how do we have different types of things, you know, discussion forums, uh, go to the places where young people are, and, you know, think about also how our schools can empower young people to participate. I mean, uh, I did move a motion in the assembly that talked about schools allowing people to go to school strike for climate because I thought it was really important that um, that opportunity was presented. Yeah, where did that motion end up? It got passed by the assembly. Yeah. So, so it's now ACT government education policy that um, students are allowed to go out to, to go to the school strikes for climate. Okay. That's pretty good to hear. Um, so I think we've got, I think it's time to move on to questions from, I think, from the public. Uh, I think we've got quite a few sort of in the chat already. So I'll just sort of, I don't know if Tony wants to have a look through and ask them or if she'd prefer it if we did. Thanks, Kate. Um, or if people yep. wanted to think about it and sort of write some more into the chat. Yep, um, I'm happy to kick kick that along. Um, some Some comments there just about, you know, got off the gas, this is how I did it. Uh, querying, you know, the role of um, electricity or gas suppliers, sort of misleading information concern around that. I think you addressed it really well. Um, there was a question, and I think given the, you know, perceived potential conflict of interest, given the ACT government is a part owner of Act AGL, you know, have there been real stumbling blocks there, Shane? You know, could it be faster given that challenge? And a question about the infrastructure, because I think the Chief Minister has observed that there's sort of like, billions of dollars worth of infrastructure under the ground, you know, and, and not to lose or waste that. So what are the options? Could you use gas infrastructure for hydrogen as a question? Yes. Um, look, I think we have still got some serious work to do on the gas company. I often get emails from people who are environmentally minded saying, I've just got my bill and they're still promoting new gas heaters and they're giving discounts on them and blah, blah. I think people find that very incongruous. Uh, and so that is a challenge. Some people have said, well, perhaps the ACT government should sell our share of the gas company uh, to remove that conflict of interest. I don't share that view. I think uh, it's better that we keep it and we actually influence it towards being a, a clean company of the future and not lose that chance to influence them. Uh, and I'm also not a big fan of just privatising essential services. So for a range of reasons, I don't think that is the right answer either. Um, in terms of the, the pipes and the infrastructure, um, they could be used for hydrogen. Uh, Evo Energy are doing some experiments at the moment looking at how hydrogen goes in our pipelines in the ACT. Uh, they're running a project out at CIT at Fishwick. That's been going for a couple of years. And of course, we've got the gas, the sorry, the hydrogen refueling station being built next door to the CIT in Fishwick, the first publicly available hydrogen refueling station in Australia. Uh, so that is, there's bits and pieces of work going on there. Um, I think the, the idea that we could just switch over to a hydrogen network, there's some big question marks over that. Um, firstly, the current devices you have in your home can't burn pure hydrogen. 
So everyone have to change the device. There would need to be a big change over there anyway. Uh, the second is hydrogen is probably not quite there yet. And a lot of the advice that I've seen is that electrification is the better option. That, you know, the modern devices are so cost effective, so efficient, that it, they not only are better for the environment, they reduce your bills as well. And so that is sort of the, the best advice that I'm getting at the moment. But I think there will be a role for hydrogen, but it might be particular roles. It might be there more as an industrial gas, but not necessarily for every household. Um, they're the sort of discussions that are going on, the sort of technical debates. Uh, You're on mute, Tony. You. Yeah, thank you, Shane. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, I'm just going to queue up um, and go back to Kate and Matt, but, uh, you know, because they want to ask a question about standards, uh, building standards, that is, and sustainability. But just to highlight that, obviously, it's been with the El Nino, a very wet season or three, and it, it brings up other issues as we anticipate um, climate events and building resilience. So not just changing how we use and what energy and how we use it, but, you know, not everyone's roofs are, are up for the um, intense storms ahead. The hail, the, um, the impacts we're going to see more frequently. So there's maybe a question there. And I, I know because we have a garage that leaks and, you know, <laughs> building standards aren't what they are now when these houses were built. So over to you, Kate. Yeah, so that's a little bit of a different direction to the way we were taking things. Um, but sort of like in the sort of Labor Greens agreement policy and as well as sort of at the last forum that we had, you talked quite a bit about sustainability standards for buildings. Um, and obviously recently the construction industry has been a prominent topic, um, maybe not for the right reasons sort of around Australia, but also sort of public housing and housing prices have been pretty topical with the latter being especially concerning for us young people. So what plans does the government have to ensure sustainable social housing, um, as well as options for young people to own a house? Like, should we just give up on owning a house ourselves um, because the prices have risen 2% in one month? Um, and in that case, are you sort of working towards sort of group and co-op housing? Yeah, Kate, I think there's two sides to that question. One is the sustainability side and the other is the affordability. Let me take them in that order. On the sustainable side, uh, we have to upgrade the standard of our buildings. And I think there's two ways to do that. One is all new buildings should be at a higher standard. Uh, and my colleague, Rebecca Vazzarotti, who's one of the other Green Ministers, she's got a new portfolio this term. It's actually um, about sustainable building. And so she's now dedicated on that. And that was part of our emphasis is we want to see more focus put in that space. We want to see new houses built to at least seven star rating. Currently it's a six star rating. Uh, so those sort of things, you know, and then we need to retrofit some of the old buildings. Uh, one of the things I've been focused on for a long time is making sure that houses that are let out for rent have a minimum energy performance standard. So many rental houses in Canberra at the moment are shockers. They're freezing cold in winter, they're hot in summer, they have big energy bills and they're not very comfortable to live in. And so I'm just working on a piece of legislation at the moment that uh, is due to come in next year, which will require all rental properties to meet certain minimum energy standards. Uh, and some people have said, well, it's outrageous. The government should not mandate that, but the market has not fixed it. And in my view, the government has to step in because some landlords simply don't look after their properties well enough and I think there is a role for government to put those sort of basic standards in place. On your question of affordability, that is a much harder question. And it is something that I'm just blown away by the way prices have increased in the last year. And it was already bad. And the last 12 or 18 months has only made it worse. And I know a lot of young people are really discouraged. I think there's a bunch of things we need to do. Some of them are federal issues. You know, we need to reform things like negative gearing and, um, and capital gains tax. I think they're both, and that's a whole other conversation, uh, but ones that I have strong views on. Uh, but also we need to do different housing types. And this goes to your question. You know, we're really interested in a model that comes out of Melbourne called Nightingale, for example. It's one we talked about a bit in the election campaign. And that's a model where, um, you know, the, 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 um, not everybody has a marble bench top, you know, and they have shared laundries. And so they will sort of look to make an affordable property that's nice, but sort of finds ways to make properties more affordable. Now, now, that will not be everybody's cup of tea, 
but I think it does help some people and all suit some. And we've got to think about those different housing types. I think we've also, you know, one of the things we're quite focused on is not letting Canberra just keep spreading out, but actually doing urban infill and thinking about how we do that in ways that are more affordable as well. And so there's also this project going called the Demonstration Housing Project. And that's where we are allowing some people to come in and do things that would break the current planning rules, but actually do to think about new types of housing. And that's also about doing some of the sort of projects you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, with sort of the rental and sort of thing, the ACD government um, sort of runs a lot of sort of public housing. Um, yes. So I know obviously we knocked down quite a bit of public housing along Northbourne. Um, but uh, I think in recently there was an announcement um, for I think it was at somewhere between 16 and $30 million towards public housing. Is that going to make sure that the public housing is sustainable or is it just focused on getting people into houses? No, it's both. Um, again, we are retrofitting a lot of the old government houses at the moment, getting out the old inefficient systems, uh, putting in better heating systems, which not only makes people... You know, cuts greenhouse emissions, reduces people's energy bills and makes them more comfortable. You know, so there's a lot of that work going on the old housing stock. Those apartments on North Point Avenue, I can assure you that an equal number have been built to replace them. So about 1,200 were demolished and 1,200 new ones, a bit over 1,200 actually, new ones will be built to replace them, just in different places. Um, and look, as the Greens, we took a commitment to the election that we wanted to build 1,000 new houses in Canberra, 1,000 new affordable and public houses in the four year term. Uh, yeah, so where's that? At? I know it's only sort of been a year, but yep, have you no, got done a quarter done or is you sort of planning to finish them all? Sort of it takes the a little end? while to get going, but we have got a plan to build those 400 public housing properties and that works well underway. And some of them have been built and more have been planned. And then the other 600, we want to do community housing. That's a slightly different th thing because a lot of the public housing goes to people who are on welfare, whereas a lot of the social housing goes to people who are perhaps on lower incomes, you know, so they're, they're not getting welfare, but they also struggle to afford a house. And so it's called the, first, uh, the second income quintile. It's some, you know, people who work in service industries, retail, hospitality, you know, and so that's another area. And so we're working with the community housing sector to work out how we get the land they need and also what sort of tax breaks and that the government can offer to help them get that housing being built because they'll put the money in to build the properties but we can help them by providing land for example yeah wonderful i think matt has a question sort of taking everything in a different direction again i was just going to go circle back a bit mm -hmm. to something related to lowering the voting age uh we we're talking you, you mentioned how people above 16 have all these different kinds of responsibilities anyway, just diff in different areas of life. And it made me think of the minimum age of criminal responsibility. Yes. How I know the Greens have a, a big focus on trying to get that raised because currently I think it's a, it's a 10 in Australia and it seems, it seems incongruous to have that so low, but still be having uh, voting ages so high and not allowing young people to participate in a positive way in yep. communities. No, you are spot on. A child as young as 10 can be sent to jail in Australia. And I find that quite extraordinary. Mm. Uh, you know, a child that age should not be going into custody. Now, that's not to say that some young people don't do bad things. They don't do things that have a harmful impact on other people. But the answer is not jail. The answer is a range of other interventions and supports and therapeutic care, models of care. Um, I moved a motion in the Assembly just before the election that the ACT should commit to raising the age of criminal responsibility to 14. Uh, that was supported by the Assembly. And then I became the Attorney General at the election. And so now I'm responsible for implementing that policy. So I'm quite delighted to have that opportunity. And we are working away at that. Uh, we're the only government in Australia who's committed to do it. And we just have finished a period of public consultation. We wrote a bit of a discussion paper on some of the issues and we went out and asked all the lawyers and the various community sector organisations as well as the public. And I'm expecting to get literally in the next few days the brief on all of the community feedback. And from that, we're going to start developing the legislation. And I expect to bring the legislation into the Assembly in the first half of next year. Mm. At the same time, we also have to design some of the 
social supports that mean that when we take away the option of putting someone in jail, we've got a different response because yeah. there will still be some people who will commit assaults or commit burglaries and stuff. It's not about having no accountability, but it's about how do we intervene in the young person's life to help put them on a better track. So you mentioned that you've recently, well, in the last of term, uh, received the portfolio of the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. Has this, um, like, does it sort of constrict your ability to work and put effort and time into the sustainability portfolio as well? Like, do you feel that, because Attorney General, that's a huge portfolio. Do you feel like you're having to sort of split time and put less into both? Oh, look, that's the nature of being a minister in the ACT, Kate. We've always got four or five portfolios. Um, you're right, the Attorney General's one is a big one, but um, I've sort of got that and the emissions reduction and water portfolios, my two main portfolios, and they're probably the ones I put most of my time into. I've also got consumer affairs and the gaming portfolio. They all take some work, but uh, they're probably my two main ones. So it is always a juggling act and there's always not enough time and more things to do. But, you know, I don't do it alone. Obviously, I've got advisors who work in my office. And then, of course, we've got the public service that we work with as well, as well as all the community organisations. You know, and the community organisations are very good at coming forward with ideas and, frankly, harassing us to get on with things. So there's lots of ways that keep us on track. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kate and Shane. There was just a couple of questions in the chat. And, and sure. one is sort of really big, really, about, I guess, the nature of, um, of the systems we've inherited, right? And the, the pandemic has give us, given us a moment to go, let's not do business as usual, right? Let's pivot this. Let's, let's seek to be bold. Let's seek to do things differently. And, of course, you know, you did economics. The Western field of economics is doesn't actually think about common interests. <laughs> it's consume, consume, consume. It's, your, it's, it's, it's actually your responsibility to shop this Christmas. Um, and so there isn't sort of a reverence and a, and a generous shareness of life at the heart of what we do. And I guess the question I'm referring to here in the chat is what are you, what are you doing to, to encourage people to actually think differently about, about wellness, about lifestyle so that it's climate friendly? Yeah. Um, I remember ACOS and Anglicare in this town talking about, you know, it's been about an anxiety, of course, about jobs and uh, the loss of jobs during the pandemic, but maybe asking, well, rather than have another store around the corner selling suits that no one was buying before, you know, we look at, at what, what the shops could be selling. You know, it's not consuming for consuming sake. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess, yeah, there's a question there about we keep seeing funding going to roads. It's pretty easy to throw money at physical infrastructure compared with the social infrastructure, which we're crying out for, like raising, right, new start now, job keeper. So, you know, what, what, what's the ACT doing there to, sh to change the prism, to change the way we, we do things overall? So it's not about flying and tourism and, and going abroad. It's about something else. Is that just too hard? You are right, Tony, that is a big question. I mean, it's big questions about what matters in life, what people value, uh, what's important to us. And I think the pandemic has really raised a lot of those questions in a way that perhaps haven't been raised for a long time. Uh, some people may recall we sort of took to the election this idea that we wanted to build a better normal. I think that was a real sentiment we all had last year between the bushfires and the start of the pandemic. A lot of us were saying, well, actually, what, what is important? And certainly our agenda is really focused on thinking about the sort of issues you've just raised. I mean, consumerism is a massive problem for the whole planet. There is no question that the consumption economy is at the heart of environmental destruction. Uh, I'm also, you know, the pandemic has given a lot of people pause to stop and think about what matters in needing to stay home and connect with our neighbours, go for walks, do things we perhaps lost touch with. We realised that you don't need to consume as much to have a good life. I think we've lost a lot of that. Uh, but the pandemic has also reinforced so much of the economic injustice that's out there. You know, there is a range of economic measures and economic indicators coming out that have shown during this period, those who are wealthy or comfortable are probably more so. And those who are already financially struggling are even worse off than they were before the pandemic. The gap has widened. 
Well, isn't it dumb? <laughs> yes. Sorry. I mean, I was a teen. I was Matt and Kate's age when I was right into Midnight Oil and, um, you know, Paul get the picture. The rich get richer, the poor get the picture. I mean, it's just history repeating itself. But it's been amplified by the pandemic. Yeah. And so I think there is a central role for government to yeah. correct that imbalance. And that is something that we are thinking about a lot at the moment is what role can we play, at least at the ACT level, to shift those scales back against some of the forces that have occurred and been amplified in recent times. Well, could you nominate some of those things given your limited levers around tax and transfers, around mm. Centrelink and the way we do social security? What can a territory government do? Well, it goes back to one of the questions Kate just asked. I think it's about investing in things like housing. So there is more affordable housing available. That is, you know, housing is such a fundamental human need that if we've got everybody in Canberra in an affordable and safe house, we've done a lot for equalising social opportunity. Education is another area. I mean, the ACT government already invests heavily in education, but healthcare, these are the areas we need to invest in. I don't think we need to build, we don't need to duplicate more roads in this city. We need to invest in our social infrastructure rather than our as much of our physical infrastructure. I think public transport, though, is a physical infrastructure we should invest in because that actually is very equalising. You know, a lot of, sorry. You certainly have as, as a Greens leader uh, and together with Labor in, investing in, in, in light rail, right? So that's a major bit of infrastructure. But what's been the impact of the pandemic in terms of people's wariness to even use it? So have there been some material costs at this time? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's been so frustrating. Light rail, you know, I've been operating for, what, 12 months before the pandemic hit and the passenger numbers were through the roof, higher than we'd expected. And I think we really started to, people have started to think about a different way to get around the city. Uh, that has been impacted, but I think it will bounce back ultimately. Do think, yeah. Do you think maybe in the interim it's free, it just becomes free to get people back on? I don't think that's the issue. I think it's about people feeling safe. You know, and I think um, there's probably different factors than, than making it free. Okay. Well, in the time we have, conscious that we're towards the end of the hour and we don't want to, um, to go beyond the hour, there's a question here that's quite interesting, given your role as Water Minister. We are part of the huge water crisis inflicting the Murray-Darling Basin, writes Michelle Smith. We hear a lot about irrigators, but what about town use of water? Could you comment on the possibility of using human manure instead of defecating into high quality water? Oh, I'm trying to look, there's a whole lot of issues there. The ACT is actually part of the Murray Darling Basin Agreement. Um, I'm, as the water minister, I now go to that meeting. So that's a fascinating thing. It's, uh, I've been to a lot of ministerial councils in my time, and the Murray Darling is one of the most political, most contested, most fractious ministerial meetings you'll ever go to. It's quite an extraordinary fight about the water in the basin. And that's a whole other question. That said, Canberrans have done remarkably well. I was actually just reading this week in a brief that I had that um, Canberran people might, will remember the millennium drought. And we put a lot of effort in Canberra into reducing our water use. And we still use per capita 35 to 40% less water than we did at the start of the millennium drought. So Canberrans have done a fantastic job of learning how to be much more water wise than they were just 20 years ago. Um, in terms of questions of should we essentially use um, recycled water for drinking water and those kind of things, there is a real community hesitation around that. Um, I saw on TV last weekend, they're just trying it again in Sydney to see if people will drink it. We're a long way from needing to do that in Canberra. I think we can continue to improve our water efficiency. Uh, so that we've got a, you know, a reliable supply for a long time going forward. We're also very fortunate that Canberra is well set up in the sense we've got a marvellous catchment and we have a pretty reliable water supply. So I think we're some distance from needing to do that. But we have got grey water systems running through, particularly here in the inner north, uh, that are watering playing fields and things like that. I think we do want to spend water on some of those green spaces because as the city gets hotter and drier, having some of those cool green spaces is actually going to be really important for our wellbeing, for coping with climate change and for keeping the city cooler than it might otherwise be. So I think that's a place yeah. where we do want to spend some water. Terrific. Any final questions, Kate or Matt? We don't have a lot of time, but is there something that has come out of this discussion for you? Another question? 
I had a thought just while you brought up the changing social sort of norms and values around consumerism is in the in the parliamentary agreement it mentions creating circular economy legislation to phase yes. out single use plastics and other things like that how is that being done or is it being done we are making some progress on that so from the 1st of July this year various plastic single use plastic products were banned uh, including styrofoam containers I think plastic cutlery was on the list this year. There's anyway, there's a program over sort of starting from 1st of July this year and on the 1st of July for the next couple of years, various things have been phased out. So that's a good start, getting rid of some of those single-use plastics, which you know, frankly, get used for 20 minutes and then get chucked away. It's a terrible waste of resources. Uh, we've got a long way to go on plastics though. We are also just about to start a trial of um, food and organic waste being collected and composted. Uh, plenty of other places have got that. Canberra's been a bit slow off the mark, but we'll soon be able to put all your green scraps out of your kitchen into a green bin that'll take away and be professionally composted. So if you don't want to do it at home, that stuff won't be going to landfill because it's a really valuable resource. So there's a whole lot of sectors of the waste stream that we need to work on. And also think about how we use some of those recycled products. We're seeing, for example, glass, Recycled glass is now being used in the ACT as the uh, bedding for pipes when they're laid. It's a great way to use their glass instead of needing to get virgin sand. So there's yeah, so lots on of the topic you can of do. sort of mm. reusing the recycled materials, um, the, the Red Cycle program of sort of recycling soft plastics, yep. um, they have said that one of their main issues. Um, and it was sort of brought up in uh, sort of the documentary that I'm assuming lots of people have watched, The War on Waste. But they just, they're not, people aren't buying the products that they make. And they often do things to make like park furniture and like sort of public tables and that sort of stuff. Is the ACT government doing things to buy that sort of furniture and implement it um, to sort of help make sure that the Red Cycle program can continue? I don't know if we procure from them specifically, Kate. It's a good question that I will take on notice and I'll go away and follow up on. Um, but I think there is a role for government definitely in that space. The first way to do that is to be a customer because government buys lots of stuff. And so government procurement is a really powerful way of sending signals to the market. The other way is to regulate and to require certain things or to potentially ban certain things uh, so that the market also gets pushed in a certain direction. I think that's the two roles for government in the sort of questions you're asking. Thank you, Shane, and great uh, stuff from Kate and Matt by way of questions. Thank you for your thoughtful listening and responding. Uh, by way of finishing, and I want to acknowledge that I haven't got to everyone's questions. Um, Dietland has provided a, 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 a mini essay here, and it looks very interesting and important. And maybe we can provide you, Shane, with the chat by way of text that you in your own time with emails if you wanted to respond to by all means of course the individuals on this virtual event are welcome to, to write to Shane in their own time in their own way um, in the time we have I'm going to ask Rachel Morgan to provide as responder a quick summary about what she took away um, Rachel Morgan is a member of Holy Cross uh, Anglican at Hackett she's a parishioner with me and she also does research into people's connections with nature she works in the research and natural resources um, area as a knowledge broker in biodiversity based at the Australian National University. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks very much, Tony. And thank you to all three of you for a fantastic discussion. I both learnt a lot and also just felt very heartened by the um, the things the ACT government is doing, but also the questions that um, mm -hmm. our younger members have asked and the, the really thoughtful conversation that you've brought to life today. So thank you, Kate and Matt, in particular for fabulous questions and discussions. I'll confess I come from a fairly different um, angle on some of these questions, in part because of my professional focus on biodiversity and in part because I am not a young person anymore. I'm now the mother of, of a younger person than you. She's, uh, my daughter is seven going on eight. 
it. And, um, and so a lot of the questions you're asking will be incredibly pertinent to her in, in eight and 10 years time as well. And so they're very dear to my heart, but, but from that perspective. So I just wanted to reflect on a couple of things that I think um, I really heard that um, from this conversation that is going well, and then I might kind of raise some more questions that I have of my own that I'm aware that Shane will have to take on notice, but I think that was part of the remit today. Um, so the first is, I. I the, the transition work that's going on is really fantastic in the ICT. I was very proud the day we could say our grid was was 100% renewable. And, and since then, you know, got, got going from strength to strength and moving on to the other transitions that need to be made in transporting gas and, and, and in other directions in household consumption. Also great to see the emphasis on a just transition, not only just transition in terms of the way it's often talked about in terms of jobs and dollars um, and, and the capacity of poorer sections of our community and sections of our community reliant on, um, on fossil fuel industries, for example, to, to make that transition in, in a way that is, is economically viable for them, but also that it is going to be a people transition and that it's about bringing the whole community along for this story and for this journey together. And I think that's so important to any kind of major change that needs to be made. I had a quick glance at your new website, the climate change parts of the ACT government's website. Fabulous. It looks really accessible. It's, I totally see what you're saying about having worked on that and, and launched that. So well done. Um, I, I'm really aware of the question Matt asked about the importance of not just putting the information out there in accessible ways, but also in a way that that encourages people to take note and, 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 and come conscious of the information that's out there and actually engage with it. And I think there's still a lot of questions about how to do that. So thinking deeply about what genuine consultation is, is genuine two-way dialogue and, and, and really making you know, raising the standard of conversation we have in our community, because it is very high out there in the community. How do we bring that you know, into government and, and, and back and forth? Um, so I think that's a real question. The other question I had is, can we please do the same with the other parts of the environment portfolio? Because the, the EPS DD, um, you know, the broader environment and wildlife and so on, there's so many stories to tell. And yet the people in our community who are telling those stories, the ACT Conservation Council and Frog Watch and, and Park Care and a lot of our volunteer, you know, Mulligan Slat, a lot of our volunteer groups are telling the story of, of Canberra's and ACT's wildlife, um, you know, and, and our connections to nature can we do more of that and on in that vein I'm both heartened and also a little bit discouraged um, heartened to see that the 54,000 trees are about putting ecosystems in place are about that whole integration and not just plonking whatever trees you know or whatever um, non-local you know or non-biodiverse systems you know to get green cover without thinking about how we can actually create habitat for wildlife and places of connection for people with wildlife I think that's really important I was a bit discouraged that you didn't talk about that today that's my only critique that you actually didn't bring that out in the conversation but I also think we can do more with that I think we can do more with our urban forests I love them. I love the microforest. I think it's a great initiative. Can we can we tell more stories around it? Can we bring Ngunnawal and Ngambri voices into that space? Can we actually have them be spaces of caring for country and spaces of, of learning, you know, of all, all of the rest of us learning to, to care for our places? And can we do the same of bringing those things into our schools and into our homes? Can we actually create programs where those things become part of the everyday connection that people make? Can we, can we actually do more for our planners and developers to actually encourage them to do more gin and dairy style developments and less clear <laughs> and fill, which is really the standard and really not necessary and not helpful. Um, Likewise, with water recovery, there's so much we can do in our homes to actually capture the water that falls off our roofs into the stormwater drains. We could actually do a lot more to build, build lush, cool habitat for species all around our, our neighbourhoods, including in medium density housing and all the community housing that you're building. So I'd like to see more discussion of that in the public and more engagement with that. Um, I, I do want to say I think that, that the question of just transition must include, you know, and, and foreground Indigenous voices. We talk in Holy Cross about becoming better stewards of, of the space that we, uh, you know, living in and responsible for, but we have to do that with the traditional owners of this land. And, um, and so I'd like to see more of that in the Greens, I'd like to see more of that in ACT government and, and more of that in the ways that we, we tell our stories and the ways that we uh, enable Ngunnawal and, and Gambri people to tell their stories um, for the rest of us and with the rest of us. 
I would have loved to see a discussion about bushfire recovery. I think what's happened, you know, with COVID wiping out the, the dialogue that was just emerging about the crisis that we're in, not just being a climate crisis, but also being a biodiversity crisis and those two things mm. being hand in hand. I think I'd like to see more of, of that brought back into discussion. I think we need to come to grips with it because it's not the last time we're going to be facing the kind of crisis. And it's also a health crisis. As an asthmatic, it's, a, it's something that's affected my running, it's affected my breathing. And so, so we need to, to think more about that. Um, and um, just finally, look, I really appreciate the need for a slow transition. I think um, the 2045 gas transition is, uh, it's certainly the best in the country, but I, I still have a question about whether it is commensurate with the sense of urgency that the IPCC report just put for, forward. We had the world's most expert scientists coming together and saying, we need to deal with this by 2030 or we are in trouble. <laughs> so can, you know, what is being done to deal with this urgently by 2030? And shouldn't Canberra be a beacon to the world on this by leading, by showing that Australia doesn't need to drag the chain and can actually be at the forefront of transition? And how can we do more to both bring the community along, but also do it with a sense of urgency that the situation seems to require? So thanks for the opportunity to provide some thoughts. Um, but um, thanks, Rachel. Uh, thanks for the thanks. conversation. Great. Well, um, Shane, lots of questions there and a, and a sort of passion and urgency in, in, in the discussion. Um, thank you all. I think, I think there's no doubt that a lot of us are invested. And uh, when my kids often ask me about politics and how change happens, I say, you have to care first. Um, and so we, we thank you for caring. Um, this is about caring for our common home. And we heard really thoughtful questions and really listening that is at the heart of nourishing positive communities. So thank you to our guest, Shane Rattenbury. Thank you to Kate Dyson and Matt Begby. Weren't they great? Uh, for Rachel Morgan and, and her summary and questions. And for Tim Watson, who's been behind the scenes this afternoon as our Zoom jockey. Um, thanks to you and all of you for your contributions in the chat and, and by listening and being there and bringing your thoughts. It's not the end of the conversation. We didn't mean to canvas everything. We didn't, it's not the great fix, but to continue to, to love, act and care. And so from me, Tony Hassan, thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Tony. Bye now. <laughs>